on. We are charged with the last panel of the day, so we thought we'd change up the format a little bit and make it as interactive as we can. Um, and I'm excited to have this panel here, and we will be doing the panel all in English, so for our Chinese-speaking colleagues, um, be ready for your uh, translations, so just FYI. Um, and please ask questions. This is uh, blockchain and all things related to blockchain and all sorts of interesting use cases. So I'm excited to have a great uh, panel here today, and I'd love for each of our panelists to do just a very quick um, opening uh, bio of themselves, and Mitchell, we'll start, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Mitchell Dong, and uh, I am a digital asset arbitrage trader. Um, I, I, I don't know if you noticed the way I said that, digital asset, uh, because we're in China. So I'm Chloe, I'm from Fenbushi Capital. Fenbushi is the first Chinese VC that specializes in blockchain investment. And I'm on the investment side. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jimmy. Uh, I'm from Lehman Bush. Lehman Bush was up here earlier as well on the family office uh, panel, so you know a little bit more about us. Uh, I've been in cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain since 2016 or so, um, both investment and advisory side on multiple projects across the board. And we also do some trading now actually as well of digital assets. Great, thank you again. And again, um, I'm Suzanne Lay. I'm a corporate investment maker in New York City, and I spend a lot of my free time um, in the fintech space, and especially spending a lot of time in blockchain. So I'm excited to be able to um, have this discussion in China about some of the important use cases and discussions around blockchain. Um, but the first question I want to ask is really, um, What's so special about blockchain, and why do we have to have an entire panel about blockchain? Why is it so special? Every event I go to is, what, what's so special about blockchain? Like, why does it? What, why does it matter? Who wants to start? Well, uh, it depends a little bit on how you look at it. Um, it's important if you look at it from a, let's call it the trading and digital and uh, financial perspective because it does offer up a brand new marketplace for people to get into trading, for people to actually invest in uh, new products and new markets that they may never have been able to do in the past. Uh, but from a technology, a technology standpoint, it's actually uh, it's superior to many other technologies out there uh, in certain aspects, like for example in the, in the transparency of the blockchain projects. And blockchain uh, technology, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of uh, transparency, which I maybe I said, yeah. Um, we also have security aspect of the blockchain projects. Um, what other things are really good? Can can I just jump in? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you guys ever remember VisiCalc, which was like the first Excel spreadsheet uh, when the Apple computer first came out. And then we have the Excel spreadsheet. Well, I, I look at blockchain as a very advanced version of an Excel spreadsheet, except that it's got many, many, many other advantages. So I think that one application is that it's just a, like a super advanced record keeping system which will transform record keeping in all industries. And I think I share something that's very similar to Jimmy and uh, Michelle, and, but from a different perspective. Um, there's a lot of buzzword surrounding the technology, like transparency, interoperability, um, security, etc. And uh, some of those values is more tangible, and some of those values I think will still take time to realize. And uh, after staying in the industry for a while, I think what I can share that blockchain can do is to remove intermediaries, and I think that's, that's very, very powerful. Um, I can explain that a little bit. So, for instance, we are in China, and we are very get used to WeChat Pay, and if I want to transfer money from WeChat Pay, the money actually going through both WeChat, or the Tencent, as well as banks behind Tencent. So both Tencent and the bank will serve as the intermediary, but if we take a look at something a bit back, a bit back, 
back to the time when we only have physical cash. And what happened by the time is that I can pass the cash to you, and once the cash is handed over, the transaction is done. There's no need of any intermediaries. And the blockchain can do exactly that. It's the first time in our human history that we are able to create something that's unique, that's transferable in a digital form without the need of any intermediaries. And that is why people like Mark Zuckerberg has once said, with the help of blockchain, we are able to send money as easy as sending a picture. And that's why we are very, very excited about this. That's great. Um, I want to I want to challenge the panel a little bit. Um, I, I talk a lot to people about blockchain and making investments into blockchain. How would you begin to uh, convince a skeptical senior manager that blockchain is really the answer? Because it is just it fundamentally changes how we think about our interaction with data. So I'd love to get your thoughts about. You know, how, how do we, how do we get people who are decision makers to think that blockchain is is, is the way to go? Uh, I'm going to throw out a little curveball here and go. Uh, most of it, the way it needs to be monitored, needs to be uh, put into a system very transparently. Uh, then yes, for example, food safety is a big thing in China. So baby powder uh, scandal happened a couple of years ago, where it was faulty baby powder that was sent in poisonous and kill babies. Uh, to make, to have blockchain towards that specific industry to make sure that from A to B, this is the exact product that went from the original originating location. That's an industry where it's not very difficult to convince a senior executive to go in. But I still believe that right now it's not the answer in most cases. Uh, I know it's not an answer to the question, but it's an interesting question on this, an interesting aspect. So I think I agree with Jimmy that for me, um, the value of blockchain is not to solve the existing problem, it's to create something more, something that never existed before. For instance, um, um, with the help of blockchain, new forms of organizational structure um, may become possible. I see there's many attempts to do a DAO um, decentralized autonomous organization where people within the uh, community are able to engage with each other and make decisions for the community without the need of a centralized organization. And it's kind of the concept of democracy. And uh, the industry is still um, looking the ways to do this best possible. Um, and what I encounter, I found very, very interesting, that, and I want to share with you is that uh, there is a new idea about a decentralized GitHub um, based on blockchain. It's something similar to GitHub, and what's different is that developer, developers are able to get rewarded based on their contribution. And the reward will be, uh, how to say, the, the reward mechanism is built into the code to um, protect the fairness of the system. And uh, if you are an executive, if something like this happens, what will change to the organization? If, from my perspective, it, it might change the way you're looking at how you're going to hire talent. So now, instead of you looking for talent locally and keep them within your organization, you can actually put those tasks on the platform and allows all the top talented um, developers across the world to compete with the same project. So I think that will have some very uh, fundamental impact to how the organization works in the future. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to now move on to um, some key examples that you that you guys know in the industry. I know I know a bunch, but some that might be really useful for our audience or people watching online who don't really understand, maybe not understand blockchain completely, but are some really good use cases that you've seen in your businesses or with your clients. So um, the hottest blockchain news is about Facebook's Libra. Um, and I think that 
where Bitcoin originally was, uh, when it first came out, as a, it was supposed to be a payment system. But it never achieved mass adoption or anything close to it. But I think given Facebook's clout, uh, Libra, its stable coin or virtual currency, uh, has the potential to achieve, to push um, a payment system uh, based on the blockchain to mass adoption, similar to uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay. I think that uh, Facebook Libra can challenge those payment systems, not in China, but uh, uh, and be a payment system as popular as WeChat Pay, but for the rest of the world. So I think that's the hottest um, example of, of a blockchain uh, technology that can change the world. Well, I have a opposing opinion about Libra. Uh, I'm not a big fan. Uh, and that doesn't stem necessarily from the fact that I don't want mass adoption, which I do, but I believe there's a time and a place, and it's been a very short time. And I don't believe that the best place to put the faith of mass adoption is in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, the main reason for that, my main concern, is that Facebook, number one, doesn't have a good track record of keeping data safe. Uh, number two, the entire idea around blockchain was to have, either from the beginning, complete anonymity. Uh, these days, it's more pseudonymous. With Facebook and the fact that you're going to buy coins, you're gonna, they're going to give you, you're going to give them fiat. Uh, they're going to give you the Libra coin, and then you're going to go on. You're going to shop on whatever you're going to shop around and use these coins on the Facebook network. They know exactly buying patterns. They know everything that you're doing with said coin. Again, more data for Facebook, the more data for Zuckerberg. Whilst at the same time, the fiat they've been taking in. Uh, when you're repurchasing all these tokens, which we can do, they can also put to use in the back end. Uh, the not as a service is going to benefit you. Uh, so, yes, I agree mass adoption is a good thing. I disagree that Libra is the answer for that mass adoption. Okay, so um, I, I agree that Facebook doesn't have a great track record with data privacy, but there, there are many, many companies that have had uh, cybersecurity leaks of their data. And uh, I think they're all, just because they have a bad track record and it doesn't mean they can improve in the future, um, although the hackers are getting better <laughs> than, than the security firms. But I think the benefit outweighs the, uh, uh, the risk. The other major benefit of, of Libra is that it's gonna force regulation. Um, uh, when, when, when Libra was first announced, the US regulators, US Congress uh, legislators were up in arms. I've never seen them up in arms against Bitcoin. Um, they were a little bit up in arms against ICOs, but that kind of came and, and went. But I think this is gonna force regulation, and hopefully they'll get it right, and we'll have balanced, progressive regulation, we'll see. But at least we'll have some regulation in the, in the industry, which will allow banks and large financial institutions in the US uh, to get in, and once they get in, that's going to increase the amount of resources in the blockchain crypto space by a hundredfold, if not a thousandfold, and then um, the rest of the world will follow. And uh, to touch on Jimmy's point about privacy, uh, the whole blockchain industry is very concerned about uh, the data leakage that's done by companies like Facebook and so the controllership they have over the data. So we are actually seeing some recent development in this area so that companies like Google, like Facebook, even though they want to use or collect the data, they cannot. Um, and I can show two examples. The first, Blockstack, uh, which is a US-based company. And what they do is they try to renovate the internet layer so that all the data associated with one ID can be collected across different platforms and only the owner of that ID has the access and the controllership of the data. So this is one example. And another one is MathBook, which is based in China. So what they do is they become a plugin of the existing social platforms. And if, for instance, if I send a message to my friend, uh, the message will be first encrypted by MassBook, and then only the encrypted message will go through the Facebook cloud, and Facebook will see nothing, and they cannot understand the content going through the cloud at all. 
And once my friend received my message, uh, MetaMask will, uh, sorry, MetaMask will help them to decrypt the data. So if you look at the whole process, only me and my friends is able to see the data, but Facebook has will have no understanding about what's message inside. Uh, yeah, and when in terms of other projects in Libra, um, I believe regulation is the clear way to go. We have to end up there eventually. Uh, my sweet spot right now is with exchanges, uh, specifically US exchanges, uh, because there we go, regulation. We have uh, exchanges like uh, Iris X and BACT receiving CFTC uh, licenses and bit licenses. We have CCX also receiving a bit license. Uh, already have a set part of the CFTC. Uh, Ledger X for that matter. Uh, I, it is essentially the foundation of the entire digital asset community are the exchanges. You're going to have to trade them somewhere. They have to have a use case on the exchange. So I like the exchanges. I am a big fan of that. That is where I want to see regulation and adoption coming out of. Uh, so we, we love the exchanges too, but if you look at um, uh, the regulated exchanges in the US versus the unregulated ones in, in China and Korea, they're, they're way ahead um, in terms of their product development and their volumes compared to the US exchanges. For example, the largest exchanges in the world are um, Binance, or B, OKCoin, uh, or OKEX, Bitmex, Bitfinex, all in Hong Kong, Greater China, none of them are regulated. And they have 10 times, 50 times the volume of, of the US exchanges. I think in part because they're unregulated. And because they're unregulated, um, the regulators have not held back uh, uh, innovation. For example, you know, I, we, we trade across all these exchanges and we seek arbitrage between all these exchanges. So we speak to all of them. And uh, like Bitstamp, for example, in, in uh, Europe, we ask them, why don't you launch futures? Why don't you have margin? And they all say, oh, we're regulated. We, can, we, we can't do that. And it would take us two years to, to, to apply for that. Whereas if you take a company like uh, Bitfinex, which has been hacked and a lot of people don't, don't like, but uh, they're extremely innovative and constantly, you know, developing new products without regulators holding them, holding them back. Regulators, you know, look at history. They they they're not so good at looking at the future. Oh yeah, I just want you speaking clearly from a trading perspective, uh, because We're obviously you like <laughs> unregulated <laughs> markets in that sense. Uh, Maybe much more trade is going to be done, much, much larger volume that we traded, whether that's real volume or not. Uh, but I still like the US side, I have to just throw that in there because specifically when we're talking about, let's say, back to the sex, they're going to get access to Chicago. Uh, you get access to the CFTC, you get access to the most liquid market in the world, and that is the commodities trading markets. No, I, I agree with that, but, but again, let's, you look at CME, which has been around for almost two years now. They're, they're obviously regulated. They're you know very good uh, uh, counterparty for a trader, but they have no volume and they only have one product. I actually want to add a point about CME. I think the reason why they didn't do so well is not because being regulated yourself is bad. It's I think they don't really understand how crypto operates, how crypto works. For crypto, it's 24 hours non-stop. You cannot operate it like traditional assets you have nine to five. So I think just those small things make um, traditional no, institutions like CMs. Yeah. You know. Absolutely, they don't trade on weekends. And um, you know, as a as a crypto trader, a lot of stuff happens on the weekend uh, when there's really low liquidity. We I, I don't know if we quantify this, but sometimes I think we make I don't know a third of our profits on the weekends. As, and CME doesn't even run on the weekend, so I agree with that point. But that's just CME, though. Now we're not talking about the actual crypto exchanges being regulated here. Yeah. So, um, I'd we'll love see. to entertain some questions from the audience for our panel. I actually encourage them to be interactive and, and challenge each other, so I'd love to hear some very challenging questions from the audience if anybody is interested. So, um, are there some microphones around? Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, I'll share uh, one quick question. So, uh, about the arbitrage, right? So, I think, uh, so what would you observe the difference uh, between the arbitrage and per trading on digital assets compared to other asset classes like uh, currency markets or equity markets or uh, commodities? Besides, you can trade on the weekends, right? So, what are the other differences? Right. So, I've, I've been an arbitrage trader for 25 years. Um, and I remember, this actually goes beyond 25 years, but in the 70s, uh, we, we were trading uh, the British pound when it first came to Chicago. And if you had a telephone and called London, you, you could get an arbitrage between London and Chicago. Um, I remember in the 80s when uh, uh, IBM stock traded in 20 different uh, stock exchanges around the world. And again, if you had a good phone, uh, you, you, could, you could identify IBM trading on different prices. Um, also in the 80s, we, we traded gold. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, and gold was traded and still is traded uh, in different countries uh, at different prices. Crypto is a you know, very nascent market, and it's similar to FX trading in the 70s and 80s. It's similar to equities trading in the 80s. It's similar to gold trading in the 80s and 90s, and that's why I like it. I like I'm not smart enough to make an edge in high frequency trading and equities, so I have to go to the outer edges because I'm not so smart. So there I can pick up much, much, much uh, bigger spreads because it's a very small, inefficient, exotic market that the big boys can't play in because they're not regulated. Uh, thank you. So I may have another question. So it's about the, uh, the, the safety of the digital assets, right? So because uh, I think this is maybe also one reason a lot of institutions, they, they are very hesitant to get into the digital assets because they worry about their safety, there is no custodian, right? Like, if you are going to broker dealers, there is a custodian. Right. No, right? I, I know. When, when yeah. we trade, you know, we buy low, sell high simultaneously, so there's, there's no risk in pure arbitrage. Um, but there's huge risk, and our biggest risk is counterparty risk, is we have to have our, our digital assets sitting on Bitfinex, for example, or CoinCheck, or Zyf, or any of these exchanges that have, that have been hacked. And so you have to carefully evaluate where you put your, your crypto assets. Uh, being a high frequency trader, uh, we can't keep it in, in cold storage. Uh, we have to be able to move it quickly. So we, we deal with the 20 oldest exchanges uh, in Korea, Japan, Greater China and, and, and the U.S. And the older exchanges, most of them are highly profitable, so they can spend money on security, and they have a balance sheet to cover losses. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I'd love to be able to entertain some questions in our last 10 minutes of the conference. Uh, I have um, read the white book, white, white paper of Libra, and uh, I'm very excited that Libra is actually doing something real tech, not just some, uh, con some technology at consumer level. But I, to my, uh, to my best understanding, I think Libra is like a Zifu uh, bar. What? As like the, not Alipay, uh, Yuga bar. It's a... Like a monetary fund. Yes. Alipay. Yes. Uh, what is it? It's a monetary fund in Adelaide. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, it's quite like a, a mutual fund that you can you, you can you can transfer uh, your shares uh, like a coin uh, to make the to make the payments. But uh, that will give Facebook a lot of power. We so the organization, the association can decide what kind of assets can be included. Uh, in the Libra, and that will give them enormous power to destroy one government, destroy one economy. I think that's, 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 you know. So my understanding is that Libra is going to use uh, the US dollar predominantly, and also the euro and the yen uh, yes. to back it, as you know, and guarantee that it's worth one dollar equivalent. Yes. Uh, and they're not including the RMB. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the Chinese government, the PBOC, has said that in order to, you know, they're, they're very concerned that 
of U.S. dollar dominance, and they want RMB dominance. So it's it's forcing the hand of the PBOC to issue a virtual currency or stablecoin based on the RMB. Yeah. Uh, which I, which I think is a good thing because as we go away from paper money yeah. to virtual money, um, it's uh, it, 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 you know obviously tremendous cost savings, but it's going to facilitate so many more transactions. The downside is that all that data goes to the Chinese government. <laughs> yeah. If, if you're into data privacy, but obviously the Chinese and the Chinese government is not. So uh, I think the Chinese government sees that as a great benefit. More data on you. Yeah, um, I'm going to hold my mouth on the subject uh, for now. We can discuss this in private. Great, thank you so much. We're here for sure. Any other, any other questions from the audience in our last eight minutes of the conference? Love to, uh, love, I love the uh, dynamic of the panel, so I'd love to get some more questions. But um, while we're waiting for some more questions, um, you know, again, I will, I will reiterate the same question I had for the last panel. Five years from now, where are we going to be with blockchain, not just in the digital asset space, but in general? Do you think we'll make some traction? Um, do you think people will really get the technology and what it really means for how we interact with our data? From an educational standpoint, I think so. I think it will definitely, I don't know if mass adoption has happened, that everybody's using it, but more people will definitely be able to use it. Uh, I believe that regulation will have caught up uh, to the point where we can actually trade not only retail money and mid-sized money, but actually institutional money. And they can do so safely and freely uh, across the world like it was intended to. Uh, and that's where I hope it will be in five years. But I mean, honestly, who knows? Uh, it's moving very fast, but it's also moving against the grain. Sorry? I uh, agree. I think it's very difficult to predict how the future will look like and um, what this year is it's going to be very different. And uh, when I'm looking at blockchain technology, and you know there's the F curve, um, I would say it's here. It's not even at the bottom of the S. So I think the industry still needs a lot of improvement before we can see applications other than trading. And um, I think one such potential application is actually enlightened by Libra, um, which is a global financial infrastructure where you can send valuable assets so easily across the world to anyone. Um, so I think in the future there will be uh, more applications to build on top of such uh, infrastructure. And uh, my another belief is that I think um, the blockchain technology won't be a standalone technology. It's going to work with other technologies such as Internet of Things or AI um, to create something that has never existed before. That's great. I, I think that five years from now there'll be at least a hundred to a thousand times more um, virtual wallets. Um, I think that I don't know what the definition of uh, mass adoption is, but where you, today you have less than 1% of people having a wallet and trading a cryptocurrency, uh, it might be getting to 10%. Um, if, if Libra, again, uh, gets 10% of Facebook users having a, a virtual wallet and leave it, uh, having Libra, I think, uh, I mean, using Libra, I think that will be considered a success, and therefore, all of that goes to the fact that um, Bitcoin prices will be much higher than they are today. In the sort of better promise. <laughs> in the uh, era of having a little bit sure. more discussion here between us, uh, something that I am really intrigued about these days is the security tokens. Um, specifically, I'm not talking just any token. I'm talking about more traditional asset classes like real estate, for example, uh, where it's popping up as an alternative to uh, other fundraising options like REITs. Um, I would love to see what my fellow panelists think about the security tokens, uh, when we are going to be seeing the first couple of big exchanges opening up and projects coming online with them, and which industries it kind of makes most sense to have them in. Is it assets we're talking about? Is it revenue? What are we going to be tying this towards? 
Um, so yeah, what do you think? Well, it seems like the real estate industry is really, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of security tokens proposed for specific real estate properties. And, you know, there are a lot of real estate sellers that would love to sell their properties for whatever reason, and they seem to be jumping on, on, on the bandwagon. Um, I agree with Michelle that uh, I noticed that a lot of uh, real estates who want to issue security tokens, and uh, now the industry is kind of stagnant. The reason is not because there is no enough sellers, is there's no enough followers. If you look at the investor of traditional real estate and the crypto investors, they are two different, very, they are two different groups. And in order to educate the real estate investor to understand FTOs, understand how to store them, how to buy them, how to you know, uh, transfer them, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, so I think there's a lot of education needs to be done before real investors can understand what a security token stands for. Um, yeah. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, any final questions from the audience? We have three minutes left in the conference, so this is your final chance to, to ask our panelists some questions. Um, and, you know, while we're waiting, if there's any other questions, any final thoughts of where, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you thinking about the space? I mean, just, there's so much we could potentially talk about, about use cases, um, different digital asset platforms. Um, so I'd love to hear final thoughts in the last couple of minutes of the conference. Um, before, before I touch on this, I actually have one more thought about security token, if you don't mind. <laughs> so yeah, the second point I forgot to mention is I see a trend. So the end of last year, what people think is they try to put the real asset onto black blockchain and make it a security token. And this year, what I noticed is people started to do synthetic assets, which means that you don't necessarily have to put the real asset there. You only need to link to the price, and you're able to trade and benefit from the price movement. Uh, so I'm very excited to see how the, how the future will look like uh, with this kind of new, new innovation. Well, this concludes the... Uh concludes the conference. Thank you all for coming and I hope uh, to see many of you in New York at Barrel's conference in November. So thank you all. Thank you.